We are live with Chef Victoria Blamey. Hi, everybody. Come on in. Um, so the idea today is, you know, when I was thinking about oysters and mollusks in general, what's interesting about them is that um, virtually any mollusk can produce a pearl, which I did not know. And um, we wanted to really think about the fact that these creatures are so unusual. We consume them as food in haute cuisine. We wear them in haute couture. And we also adorn ourselves with them in high jewelry, which, of course, most of us are coming from the perspective of jewelry. So what, you know, I think is quite fascinating is that if any mollusk can produce a pearl, why don't we see more? And the reality is only one in 10,000 oysters could produce a natural pearl, and very few of those will be gem quality. Until about 1950, 70 to 80% of oysters were from the Persian Gulf. And in 1893, um, Kokichi Mikimoto cultured um, the first reliable cultured pearl which swamped the industry, ruined the price points for natural pearls, which have come back, but they were up to 10 million a year in 1930. So, you know, why don't we see more? Why doesn't that happen? First, it's incredibly dangerous. As you know, you may or may not know, you have to dive up to 100 feet to find the oysters. There are sharks, there are pirates, there are the bends. The second is pollution. And if we think about pollution and over-harvesting, which is the third, what I'd love for you to think about is that New York used to be the hub of oysters. And in um, 1790, the population of New York was 49,401. By 1930, when the oyster beds were polluted and shut, it was 6,930,46. And now we're at 8.4 million in New York City. So it's not a stupid question to say maybe our population is so dense that we pollute too much, we can't support the oysters that we'd like to have. The next element that we're going to talk about is infestations. So there are some little creepies like zebra mussels that are causing tremendous problems with dams as well as with the the mollusks that produce the pearls that we're interested in. And some, frankly, are really ugly. So... Today we have magical chef Victoria Blamey. She is famous for her treatment of shellfish, among other aspects of her cooking. And I've asked her to prepare three different dishes with mollusks for us to discuss and enjoy in the context of, you know, these creatures that we consume in so many different ways. So Christopher Walling has very generously loaned us some incredible examples from his collection. He is going to be our disembodied voice on the phone. I like to think of him as Charlie and Charlie's Angel, so we'll be calling on him. I call Farah. I would recommend Jacqueline Smith over, what was her name, Kate Jackson. I thought she was cooler. We could do the... Um, But what we're going to be doing is discussing the different pearls that different mollusks produce. Helen Molesworth, I'm glad you are hungry. You're going to die when you see what Victoria produced. And we have, as you can see below, the camera on the dishes that are about to be coming forward. So I want to start us off with the South Sea Pearl. Thanks, Vic. She's going over to plate, and you can see below while she's plating. So this magnificent number is the famous Pinctada Maxima, also known as the oyster that produces the South Sea Pearl. Welcome, Sophia Pazpele, because we're about to talk about you. (laughs) So what does a South Sea Pearl look like? Well, oh, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, What we want to think about, and I'm going to put some images up on camera, is that South Sea Pearls and the Pinctada Maxima produce not only exquisite pearls, um, they are found in Australia, Tahiti, the Philippines, and Indonesia. They are the largest of all pearls, typically 11 to 16 millimeters. People love goldens, but, you know, as Christopher is probably going to jump in and add, you know, the, the glowing champagne and whites that you can see on Sophia Paspaley's Instagram are also mesmerizing. Um, And what I want to point out with these is that they actually produce a number of different sources of 
ingredients that we love in haute cuisine. So what you see on the camera here is pearl meat. And pearl meat is the adductor muscle of the pintata maxima. And today, as we're talking about the different kinds of mollusks, I want to have a particular emphasis on sustainability. So what's exciting about the, um, the pearl meat is that there's only six tons produced a year, almost exclusively in Australia. I believe Paspaley actually supplies pearl meat, so Sophia, please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. But um, it is an incredible delicacy that is sustainably sourced. So pearl meat, it looks like a scallop, as you can see on the screen. And it can be used, um, the taste has been described as like a cross between lobster and calamari. And it can be used in a wide variety of incredibly fascinating dishes. So think about pearl meat. Um, and Sophia, if you can help us get some, I'd love to give Chef Blamey some pearl meat as well. The second major of the oysters that produce um, pearls that we want to talk about is the Tahitian, the Pinctada margaritifera, margar margaritifera. I, I always think of it as the margarita one. So the margarita one produces the um, also quite large 9 to 14 millimeters. And this is a pair of uh, Christopher Walling's gorgeous Tahitian pearl cufflinks. And the most prized here is the peacock overtone, which is like purples and greens, if you can see that iridescence. Helen, I do need a margarita to say that because I am murdering that wonderful, wonderful name. <laughs> so, um, Vic, how are you doing for time on the first oyster, oyster dish? Should we... Uh, um, like two minutes? Like two minutes? Yeah. Okay. So Victoria is going to be presenting the first oyster dish. And you just got a chow chef, you are the best. Um, so what I would love is for everybody watching, please jump in into the question mark box if you have any questions or comments. But if we think about the, the interaction of South Sea and... Um, and Tahitian, the big thing to remember here is that they're now almost entirely cultured. Victoria is preparing, are they well fleets today? Uh, blue points. They're blue points. Victoria is preparing blue points. So the other thing that I would say is people send in some questions asking about the safety of oysters. Always go with whatever is, you know, the most fresh and local. And if you are lucky enough to be in a city like New York where we have incredible seafood purveyors, you can have access to lots of other ones. But that's one of the reasons why we have oysters rather than pearl meat today, because we're going with what's nearby and what's amazing. Um, and then what I want to get into, which I think is kind of fascinating, um, when we look at this gorge oyster, again, the Pinctada Maxima, um, notice that the inside of this fab shell is white. And the next one we're going to be talking about after our first oyster dishes. Ah, oh, that's actually a great question. So um, we have the question, how long does it take in nature for a Tahitian pearl to be produced? And our Charlie on the phone says three to five years. So, you know, the big thing to, to think about when we think about mollusks is that in order for them to form naturally, if they grow really slowly, like the conch, which we'll be talking about later, they're much more likely to get over-harvested and endangered as a result. We also want to think about how hard are they to get to. So the conch's really easy to get to. It also grows really slowly, which is worrisome. The, the Pinctata maxima, on the other hand, again, you're about 100 feet into horrendous waters with sharks and pirates, so not the easiest. But at the same time, 1 in 10,000 are naturally producing a pearl. So what produces a pearl naturally? Basically, something invades the oyster. That could be a parasite. That could be a piece of shell. It gets irritated. And in order to protect itself, it puts layers of nacre over whatever the irritant is. The big breakthrough of Kokichi Mikimoto in 1893 was to figure out how to reliably, consistently introduce an object into that oyster in order to encourage the development of a pearl. So we do have our wonderful dish coming over. 
and Vic is coming over. Um, ooh, fab. All right, so Victoria, Hi. will you tell us, please, what do we have here? Um, can you see him? Right. So um, it's, it's a bit of a play, play because the second one is going to be also with, can you see me? Yes. Uh, with, uh, this has watermelon rind. Um, a lot of people for years, you know, they've been actually using the watermelon rind to pickle it. Um, we kind of just, instead of just pickle, we did it with a little bit of a seaweed stock. That was just seaweed kelp and chamomile vinegar. So that's what you see on top, the sort of chiffonade. Um, and then the marinade or the, sorry, the mignonette is actually yuzu kosho, um, chamomile vinegar too, uh, lemon juice, which I love that kind of, um, what it gives to an oyster, I'm a big fan of lemon. And uh, white peppercorn. Now this white peppercorn is really interesting. It's from a really good purveyor that I use all the time, burn up a barrel, and they're actually fermented. So it has a really wow. interesting note. And what I do love on oysters in general, too, is just to add on um, some fat. And by that, I mean either avocado oil. This one has piquao, which is a Spanish uh, variety. And a little bit more spicy, which I think with the salinity of the uh, blue point goes really well. So Awesome. If you were doing this for a dinner, what would you plan with it? Or what would you recommend for viewers if they want to replicate this later? What would you pair it with? Pair it as in like to drink it with? To drink as well as to eat. Oh, so this is part of your meal. I would what just eat this. You would just eat <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to eat oysters, I'm going to eat a lot of oysters. I wouldn't eat it with anything else. I would say drink it with champagne, but then, you know, <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, yeah, so the second one would be also sort of watermelon. Because I think sometimes with oysters, you know, we can usually tend to go with citrus. We, we go... Uh, with spicy, you know, but now this time we go with the citrus and the sort of vinegar note, but on the second one also people tend to forget that fruit also goes really well with um, oysters, so we'll use watermelon on the next oyster. Awesome. Great. Okay. Great. Let's do the next one. Yeah. So in case you did not already know, the reputation of oysters as um, an aphrodisiac dates back to the Roman, I think it's Vitellus, who ate a thousand oysters in a day and would have 50 a day to um, assist his libido. <laughs> and um, I'm asked what pearls I would wear. And in fact, I will show you. So this is um, a banded South Sea pearl, and my dad was on a design team that uh, was responsible for the Sydney International Terminal, and when I was a little kid, I saved up my uh, allowance, and it was almost one of the first pieces of jewelry that I bought myself, and I still wear it all the time. It is a Paspali pearl. And when I went into Paspali, I remember being blown away by the spectacular colorways of their pearls. So Christopher, I think we have our first major question for you, and it may be impossible, but what is the, um, the source behind the variation in the overtones? So what would give you a golden versus, say, a Tahitian peacock? And I'm gonna put you on speaker as our Charlie. So the, the comment was, um, you can have the, uh, the temperature can change the resulting overtone. And um, you also have, you know, the differences in the water, et cetera. Sophia has gracefully declined to be on camera because it's 1130 at night and she's in her pajamas. <laughs> so um, we're going to be bringing on our second round. But Sophia, if you want to add to that in the comments, so, um, again, for the viewers joining us, we're looking at all the different mollusks that produce pearls, as well as the ways in which we consume them and wear them. And the close-up you're getting right now is oyster dish number two, which is headed our way. And, yes, that is algae, and it's going to be spectacular from... Uh, the fabulous chef Victoria Blamey. You can see her hands plating right now. Um, and in the meantime, one of the things that I think is really incredible is that um, in cultured pearls, it turns out for both freshwater and um, South Sea and Tahitian, and Sophia, jump in if you have some additions to this, but the best nucleus turns out to be the shells of the Mississippi River mussel. 
So weirdly enough, the best we can do and the best starter, actually, you know, Americans live to claim that we're the source of everything. This gorgeous creature with a pink inside is a muscle. And I'm going to show you a picture of the Mississippi River mussels because they look pretty different and they're quite interesting. So here's a Mississippi River mussel. And it turns out that when you take this shell and one of the primary sources of business now for the Mississippi River mussels is to actually ship those shells to China for freshwater pearls and to Japan for cultured Akoya as well as South Sea and Tahitian. So you might ask, why don't we see actual pearls out of these very often? The first is, again, it's a global business. Not many people want to do this kind of diving and work to collect them. The second is there's a real problem with zebra mussels. There are these, these microscopic little monsters who basically squish them out. Um, we'll pick that up in a second because dish number two has arrived. Um, we're now going to talk about a second treatment of oysters. And, yeah, exactly. So Sophia has added in that the nuclei are the Mississippi clam shell, the one I just showed you, so muscle clam. Um, all right, so Nick, what we got? Um, so, like I said, you know, here the, the difference with the watermelon is that we're using the sweetness of the fruit um, instead of the rind that actually does have a very crisp texture, and that's what people actually use it, and they tend to pickle that. Uh, not necessarily a lot of the flavor. So here we have the watermelon, which is a disc that I cut. It has been brushed with a little bit of um, pink celery vinegar that I made, and then that's actually pink celery that's been pickled. And what's on top is actually fried um, sea lettuce, uh, seaweed that has been mixed cool. with salt as well, just to give you that salinity that is not just um, fruit note and cream. But then if you eat this, basically there's not, apart from the pickled celery, there's not really any vinegar or lemon. So you just want to kind of uh, taste the creaminess, you know, I would say, of the oyster. So then it's just a different pairing in general. Gorgeous. And for this one, when would you do this versus the other one? Um, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I think, I just think this one is a little bit more challenging because people in general don't tend to eat Nowadays, like fruit with uh, with any kind of shellfish, and it requires to be a more adventurous, um, you know, eater. But I would do it anytime. I just think it depends on the customer, you know. Um, I think the same people tend to be more classic, and you know, sometimes it's fun to be more adventurous. Actually, I forgot to mention that also we did grate a little bit of dehydrated oysters. So, usually, what I used to do when I had oysters left over instead of freezing them, a lot of people do that, and that's that's fine, but I just started uh, dehydrating them and use them in stocks or broth, and actually I love the flavor. Um, it is obviously more pungent, but it has a very interesting note to any kind of Madeira as well, so I wouldn't probably, I uh, would not, you know, pair with Madeira, but maybe it would be more adventurous to do something like a Van John or some kind of uh, orange wow. wine. Yeah, rad. So now then after this, we're going to do mussels, which I thought it was so interesting, you know, that <laughs> you have oysters from mussels, so that's why I'm going to do... I know, isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's crazy, because also I read that most of oysters come from clams and mussels, but not oysters. I'm oh, sorry, mussel pearls. That yeah. is correct. So, All right, you want to break. You yeah. want to sit with us for a second? We're going to look at some of the pearls that come out of the mussel nucleus. Sure. All right, so we're going to do fresh water. And, you know, why is fresh water cheaper? So the first thing to keep in mind is it's more readily available. It is easier to tickle that mollusk into producing a beautiful product. So what we have here, I'm going to try to get that in. This is a Baroque fresh water that has magnificent luster. So I understand from Christopher, whose disembodied voice may join us on this, or you could just comment, Christopher. Um, it is less likely that you're going to get the luster. Again, it may be the um, it may be the um, the issue with um, the water, the temperature, the location, etc. But they don't tend to give us that same sort of snappy spectacular. Of course, Christopher has some snappy spectacular, and he uses them frequently in his jewels, which is how we lucked out. 
So here's another example of a really gorgeous one with great luster. So again, this is a fresh water. Um, yes, Helen will be tickling mollusks while sipping cocktails. Funky, right? So these are Gorge. I love them. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure everybody is aware of, but you can actually use a specific shape. Thank you. Thank you, Chef. You can use a specific shape to form the freshwater pearl according to that shape. And one of the most famous is these earrings, these X earrings that Christopher created. And these were worn by Maya Angelou, among others. These are incredible incredibly gorgeous. They are a wow, Janelle. I agree. And um, again, pretty spectacular. So again, these are coming from mussels. They are primarily Mississippi River mussels. That pink one, again, is a Mississippi River mussel. As Sophia said, they're using the Mississippi River clams for their South Sea. This is the best nucleus. And we can't get them here because nobody wants to bother. Womp. Um, wow. So Christopher says he first flew to meet James Peach um, in 1980, sent by André Chervin of Carbon French. Incredible. So I just want to put this out there. <laughs> At the moment, freshwater, uh, freshwater pearls are readily available. The mussels are readily available. So if you're at home thinking about what to cook with, thank you, Chef. Yeah. Um, if you're at home thinking about what to cook with, Mussels are a relatively sustainable option, so you, you needn't be as concerned about depletion with the mussels, um, which is important. Now I want to move into some serious weirdos. So now we're going to get into the mellow mellow, which Christopher calls just mellow. And these are, funnily enough, a snail. So it turns out we have a ton of cool pearls that come from snails. And um, I'm going to give you an example of one. So this again from Christopher's collection. Let me get rid of the photo and I'll just show it to you close up. Is a mellow pearl. I'm mm, going to try to catch that on camera, but it's looking a little rough. Um, can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can see this okay? So the mellow is described, there we go, described as yellow, but I think it looks kind of peachy yellow, personally. Um, they don't tend to get as large, because again, the snail is not that large. But, you know, if you wanted to and you were interested, yes, you could make jewelry with the mellow. And Christopher, why don't you give us a, a shout on the comments, if you don't mind. Have you actually made jewelry with mellow pearls? I don't know the answer to that. I know it's blurry, Kathy. I'm trying. How about that? I think I can, if I roll it, I can sort of catch it around the light. It is, I know you think it's yellow, Christopher. I think it's like a peachy yellow. Somebody back me up. You see kind of a peach in here, right? Not just me. I did very well in my color identification at GIA. I feel like it's peachy yellow. Anywho, so that was the mellow. And, you know, they're found in Southeast Asia. Why don't we see them more? Because they are not that pretty. You know, part of it is demand. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. I will roll the other ones as I put them up. Um, thank you, Michelle. Uh, you're the greatest. Um, the next one, I don't know how those of you feel about conch. I, uh, Sophia says canary yellow, so I'm going to have to go to the experts. Christopher and Sophia have spoken. It's canary yellow. If you're looking at the camera below, Chef is creating something incredibly magical with mussels, and you're going to see it in a second. But my personal favorite, and the one that I was the most disappointed to find out is not a sustainable choice, is conch. Um, Christopher, again, insists that the singular is conch, but I'm going to go with conch because it's all I've ever heard. So conch is from the Caribbean, the Florida Keys, the Bahamas, and Bermuda. And we know, you know, if you've had conch fritters, they are to die for. They are amazing. Unfortunately, Conch is appendix two endangered. They grow really slowly. They are easily harvested. So I'm sorry to say chefs at home, 
you should take conch off your list. So if you're looking for delicious, sustainable meat, let's go with the, um, the option of the pearl meat if you're able to access it. Mussels are in the clear. Um, but, but basically a no on the conch. So I'm gonna show you now a conch pearl. They are incredibly beautiful. They are um, what we typically describe as, I think it's flame. So you can see incredible colorways in them. They are pink. They are very, very beautiful. So here's our friend, the conch. And you can get these a lot bigger, but remember that if you do, you know, this is a very slow growing creature. And um, while there are thousands of conch pearls on the market, Please don't, because we don't want to continue to encourage the over-harvesting. It is appendix two endangered, unfortunately. I know, um, Dara Daniel, our conch roti is delicious. Conch fritters are exquisite. And, you know, for me, it has to go into that category of orange roughy. I'm going to think fondly of it and miss it until we find a way to bring it back because we don't want to over-harvest these creatures. And they, they do grow incredibly slowly. So please do keep in mind, the bigger the conch pearl you see, it really grows slowly. And you don't want to encourage the demand for that because at the moment, they really are endangered. The estimate is that within 200 years, they'll be gone. So um, conch is the only entirely different crystalline structure in a pearl. Again, because they're snails, they're not laying down layers of nacre. So it's actually primarily calcite. So who knew? Um, feel free, by the way, if you're just joining us, throw your questions in. What you see below on the screen, the chef is prepping the mussel dish, which we're going to talk about in a second. And um, I will now show you one of my big favor favorites, which is the quahog. The quahog is basically an enormous clam. And they're mid-Atlantic. Um, they are honestly pretty ugly. So that's a quahog shell. And I'm going to show you the quahog pearl. So why don't we see more of them? The reason we don't see more of them primarily is that they are ugly. They don't really have luster. They are not sort of what we gravitate towards as far as like what makes a pearl gorgeous. However, they are sustainable. So, you know, you can use quahog just like you. Here, I'm going to try to catch the light for you guys. Oh, there we go. So what you can see is nothing shining on this. It is not lustrous. This is a quahog pearl. And you can use quahog the way you use any clam. So New England clam chowder. Um, it is sustainable. It's readily available. Sadly, it is kind of like the last cake picked in gym as a pearl. It's just not that cute. They're a little ugly. Um, all right. So then another thing that's interesting, I know we have Opal Republic on with us and she can jump in, but too blurry. I, no, I'm not that good at it. I'll give it another shot because we're about to do muscles and then I'm going to move into another creature we love. All right. Hi, Seth. Hi. What do we got? So, um, muscles. Um, you know, a lot of people sometimes don't like eating muscles, which is true because they, they're sort of like a chips man. Shellfish. I love them. Um, in general, people don't find them refined, uh, which is kind of crazy. You know, I, I'm actually a much, much bigger fan of um, clams and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so here I just um, wanted to do something a little different. I mean, a lot of people steam mussels, but instead of like make them on the shell, I steam them um, just a little bit before they were done take them off the shell, um, and we pair them with um, some sort of burnt cabbage. Um, there's a really interesting cabbage still at uh, the market, which oh. is a very nice and sweet leaves, you know, very tender, which this one is actually great for raw cabbage, but this one is slightly steamed, char, and then you have some leaves of that at the bottom. Okay. Um, the mussels are steamed and then reheated on a bed of seaweed just so it doesn't, so the heat is not too aggressive. Okay. And the sort of dressing is a, it's a reduction of burnt onion and black garlic. Okay. And that almost acts like a sort of barbecue effect. Wow. Um, on top of that, we have a little bit of also galangal, that's the white grated 
uh, route that you guys see. And um, that's also from the market, by the way, um, which gives it a ton of spiciness. So it's not as yeah. spicy as ginger, but it has a very interesting uh, perfumey aroma um, note to it. And then on top, we did um, I have some shrimp shells, which I know has nothing to do with this. <laughs> um, but we did some, uh, you know, um, a little bit of uh, fried, sorry, roasted uh, shells and also more seaweed with salt just to give the, you know, that uh, umami flavor. Love. All right. So first question is, I typically think of people making mussel dishes mm -hmm. as simply as possible, a bunch of cream on top, and you just sort of sock them up. Well, why one? Why one? Why one? So make why them. make them spicy and much more exciting? This is totally different from what we typically see. You know, yeah, I mean, I've also, spices. I've made them too with tomato and no cream. In general, I kind of, I'm not a necessarily big fan of cream, to be honest. So I've also made them with tomato, uh, with fried uh, garlic, you know, and then, you know, some sort of dry white wine and some uh, Korean tomato, uh, sorry, Korean uh, chili paste. So I mean, there's so many ways to go about it. I just think yeah. about being right. careful not to overcook them, you know, okay. they cook really easily. And How do you honest, know when they're ready? Well, I mean, they start opening up. So, I mean, it, it's really telling, you know. But apart from that, you know, when they start wrinkling, you know, when people just have them there for too long, that's not what you want. You know? <laughs> not really. Um, but it is I don't, easy to say. I don't own know. a mixing All you need to know is that you need to make sure they're, they're not sandy, you know, and then um, <clears throat> and that's it. So, there are many ways of just trying to be more playful with uh, shellfish. I love that. that. Now, if we're trying to do this one, what would you drink with it? Interesting question. Um, hmm. Probably either orange or I would like to see if I have a light red wine. But I like I'm not that. a sommelier, so wow. don't quote me on this. Um, like but I would try that. I mean, it is sweet as well. You know, okay. it's more sweet barbecue tone than than anything else. And the cabbage yeah. gives you that. Um, it has an interesting um, aroma to that, yeah. that, that fights with it in that way. So, I mean... Yeah. But one of the things that I love about your food, and in particular your treatment of shellfish, is that you combine basically the cuisines of lots of different places. So when I think of, you know, adding the galangala, I think about adding the seaweed, mm -hmm. it's not a French approach, it's not an American approach. And for those of you joining us, um, Chef is from Chile. When did you come to the U.S.? Uh, 2010. Seriously? Yeah. Well, 2008, and then I came here to stay in 2010. Wow, your English is incredible. Well, I didn't learn English before that. Dude, that's on fire. Okay. I, mean, I was and, working in England, too. So. And also, yeah. we are both immigrants. Are you naturalized? I'm naturalized. I don't know. Um, naturalized. So I think in general more also what chefs, you know, these days, I think people in Denmark are not doing a lot. It's mm -hmm. uh, using, you know, seaweed in Chile. Years and years ago, I was reading about seaweed. You know, people used to actually incorporate seaweed in their meals more than right now. Um, it is largely utilized in the industry for algae, is for a thickener agent and all the really crappy sort of sweets and gums that people use. But to be honest, I think it's interesting to kind of like make an effort to introduce that in, in, in dishes, you know, because it is highly nutritious and also sustainable, as we say, plant-based, um, that is not necessarily doing something that like, is a plant-based cracker or something that people do, you know, which I'm not against it necessarily, but I'm just saying that nature, you know, we have to be in touch with nature a bit closely and more hands on it. Yeah. Um, someone's just asking if we're going to eat this. We're totally going to eat this. But not right now. It not right now. It is 10.30. Yeah. I'm also not going to let anyone see us eating on camera because okay. it's not attractive. <laughs> no, have you ever seen it, like, when you look at someone eating in a restaurant, like, sometimes I get thrown off. Like, I see them eating, and I'm like, mm, no, I'm not hungry. And it's not necessarily, but I just think that it's already for that. And it's, I had a huge hangover. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't. If you know me, you know I can eat at any time. So I will actually be scarfing these down the second we turn the camera off. Um, Kathy was asking, mm -hmm. uh, do razor clams produce pearls? They do, but they're ugly. Huh. So, Is that because of the shape? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, they're a little, they're a little meh. Uh -huh. So what we're going to show now actually is another good one. Mm -hmm. So abalone, you may or may not know, is basically also a snail. And fun fact, Christopher Walling, our disembodied voice Charlie, has a um, 
a pearl from an abalone named after him. So this is the Christopher Walling pearl that was shown in the Smithsonian, and it was actually the very generous loan of Pez Paley pearls, and Cynthia is also on with us. I know, isn't that absolutely yeah. beautiful? So the trippy thing about abalone is they can make these iridescent blue pearls as well. They're well, found they're in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, their shell is yeah. forged, the yeah. mother of pearl yeah. that we think about. So if you grew up in Northern California like I did, you probably remember seeing abalone shells everywhere mm -hmm. and getting all excited. So abalone, again, I'm really sorry to do this to you guys, even though we adore them. Abalone are severe hemophiliacs, and the prediction, again, is that they're going to be extinct within 200 years. So, guys, I'm sorry, but please take the abalone off your list for food and for pearls. We really want them to keep going and stay alive, so please know on the abalone. So if you're keeping count, conch, endangered, abalone, endangered, you're in the clear on mussels, go for it. And again, that's giving you all these gorge fresh waters that we love, as well as the nucleus for some of our favorite South Sea and Tahitian pearls. Um, for the, the clams in general, you're pretty much in the clear, and that includes the quahog, which is slightly more expensive. Um, you can go for it if you want. Pintada, um, Mark, I'm gonna do it again. Margarita Farah. I know. Uh, Kathy said abalone is so important to Asian cuisine. You know well, what? Actually, that, chicken, chicken, well. Well. Chicken, chicken, yeah, yeah. yeah. So know. yeah, it's huge. The cool. thing is that it's also been uh, endangered because of consumption. Too much of it. Yeah. Um, and also in Chile, you know, we do have seasons where we eat actually sea urchin because it also has been endangered. So I think it depends also on the region. Yeah. Uh, obviously, mussels and clams, you know, because of farm and oysters. They are very sustainable, especially because they treat water and they filter water as well. So they yeah. do something really great for um, uh, polluted water. Um, yeah. But abalone in Chile was a gigantic thing. You know, we used to eat them fried or so super good. simple with like mayonnaise. I mean, I used to hate them. Um, but really? I, did, I got sick as a child, and then it took me a little bit to understand how to eat it again. But um, but it also <laughs> super valuable and. Um, but yeah, there's also seasons for that. And also the problem of um, exportation, you know, so you export too much, which is a problem that we have with seafood these days. Absolutely. And all the globalization, it has brought a lot of problems for seafood, you know. So as a chef specializing or known for seafood among your other many talents, I mean, that's one of the uh -huh. things that I heard about first with your work. Uh -huh. um, how, how aware are you or how much are you advised about the sustainability of the ingredients? So I don't know how many of you knew that the conch was endangered, that abalone is endangered. Sophia is asking, is it endangered worldwide? It is. They are, yeah. Abalone are severe hemophiliacs, poor things. So they do bleed out. I actually have them in Turk and Caicos recently, and then I learned there that, yes, they're in danger. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, more and more these days, of course, about sustainability. I think the problem is, is that a lot of people try to say they're sustainable, and to be honest, to be 100% sustainable is incredibly difficult. I don't even, I've never heard of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's tricky. You know, you have to be informed, um, and you have to read a lot. I think to be in close uh, contact and, you know, have a, a close relationship with your purveyors, you know, that helps a lot. But, I mean, on the other hand, you know, for example, I love working with avocado because I grew up with avocado. And I also know that avocado is not necessarily the most sustainable fruit. So, you know, it's about choices that we have to make. I think mm -hmm. uh, more and more, if we really do want to keep living this planet, we do have to make a radical change. And I think our job in general is to try to educate ourselves, but also educate um, our customers. And that gets a little tricky sometimes because people are set on their ways. You know, they want to eat salmon all the time. They want to eat the same thing all the time. And they don't just want to sort of, you know, go out of their comfort zone to understand and to be in touch with the food that you're eating. You know, you just go to a restaurant and then you have no idea all the steps. You know, it's like slaughtering houses, how... You know, if you, eat, if you eat meat, do you really need to eat meat every day? How much red meat do you really need to eat? So I think there's a lot to talk about that. And 
in general is a sort of touchy subject and I love to do more, you know, but uh, I also do know that it's, it's difficult because of, you know, everyday life, you know, restaurant mm -hmm. life. Um, yeah, but I mean, it is, uh, it is something it's super important for me. So, yeah. So you have headed to major restaurants, Chumley's and Gotham Bar and Grill. You just finished a residence at the Mayflower and you have some really big things coming up. There are almost no women who head major restaurants. I think there's only three globally who have Michelin three star. Right? Dominique well, and uh, Sophia, no, but Sophia and Peek as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of women. It's just more that we're much more quiet. I think in general, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Michelle Rodriguez at a, um, um, you know, at Boston. There's a, there's, you know, women out there that have you know, been working in huge restaurants and, you know, it's a lot of work. So I think that in general, we just tend to go with what we know, mm -hmm. you know, and then we tend to be more critical when someone is slightly overexposed, you know, I don't think we talk about men being overexposed, you know, but when women are, we are very critical about it. So I think that's also a problem when there's only a few to look at everybody over focus. Yeah. And then, you know, they're like, well, she's overexposed. And I'm like, okay, do guys can be overexposed and no one cares. So <laughs> that's what I think in general. So um, if I'm thinking about that movie, Matthew Bar Broderick, Marlon Brando, they are, Marlon Brando is the host of a club of people who like rare and endangered food. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot when we look at sustainability, because, you know, in 1930, when we base it, the freshmen, that's exactly it, the freshmen. Everybody watching, please watch this movie if you haven't. It's going to give you, you'll laugh, but you'll also think a lot about sustainability. So when we're talking about food like this, when you're working with a creature that is being <laughs> overconsumed, we're overconsuming shellfish, now the oyster, in three different ways. So we have it in clothing. So I'm going to show you a couple of pieces from, um, actually, this is at the, oh, no way. Kathy said that part of the freshman was filmed at Raul's on Prince Street. Oh, wow. I no. Well, I was going to watch the movie. Um, I don't want to give anything away. You have to watch it, but then I'm going to ask you about it because of your review on food. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I thought of that movie is that, you know, as a, as a chef, you are subject to the tastes of your customers and what they're asking for. And in some cases what they were, you know, really organized around. Mm -hmm. What do you do if it's something like this, where there's a demand for abalone, there's a demand for conch, you know, they're endangered. You know we're consuming the pearls. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a Pucci shoe. Here we have the incredible headpiece. I think this was Alexander McQueen. Yeah. 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 And this one is the um, Balmain of mm -hmm. Couture. And, you know, in some cases, certainly as um, Raphael Blues pointed out in the balls, they have real pearls sewn into their clothes. So if you're thinking about 1930, when you have the glut of cultured pearls on the market, 10 million, we basically have depleted the oyster beds in New York completely. Well, by 1950, actually, there was a big problem also in San Francisco in the consumption of oysters because yeah. it was just too much. 100%. Yeah. So how do we think about balancing that when you are, and I, I do want to highlight again, you know, during COVID, restaurants have been horribly affected. And if you're carrying these specialized foods and you're trying to be ready and there's no support, you know, what can a, an informed viewer do to support the industry other than obviously ordering? Well, I mean, to be honest, the first one is, is just to go. You know, I think to go to a restaurant is the biggest support right now. Mm -hmm. uh, one's going on indoor dining, which is a really tricky um, situation and it's uh, going to be a tricky event for everyone to navigate. I think also going, you know, I, I understand that it is, you know, uh, you know, it feels a little bit dangerous to go indoors. I understand the, the ramifications of it and, you know, but I, I also do think that there's a lot of people sometimes that they're gathering with friends indoors in their house. So a lot of restaurants are pretty much a lot of them, all of them, but they're taking the necessary, you know, steps to make sure that you're feeling safe, that they're following the, the requirements for COVID. So I think that's the major one. 
Um, and if there's any kind of option, you know, that people need to support, that's also good. But I think just by going there, you know, what people get so excited about is by seeing the regulars, by seeing the people that love going to your restaurant. And that's what we miss right now is the aspect of socializing with that more than the food itself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and why in the sense of like when people want one thing and this in danger, I mean, to be honest with you, I just don't care. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't think we should just, you know, act by the demand of too many people, you know, like if, for example, you know, people will probably die when they hear at one point that chicken will, could be in danger. Let's say, I mean, that's not going to happen, but let's just put a very dramatic example. Well, then just don't have chicken on your menu, you know. I mean, yeah. I've been to restaurants that they actually don't have red meat and they might have venison or they have deer or they have other kind of wild animal. And, mm -hmm. and I understand that. So I think it's just um, not succumbing to, to that sort of blackmailing, mm -hmm. you know. So... There's a lot of that. I mean, I don't think necessarily all the time New York is the most adventurous city mm -hmm. to eat, you know. Really? And, no, not at all. I mean, oh. I, I actually wasn't, you know, dying to come at the first time because I think in the in general people, I love that. I love the energy of the city, but food-wise, people are much more traditional. Interesting. Um, and I think in general there were really, really interesting restaurants about like eight years ago that have been, you know, closing and has nothing to do with or anything like that so. mm -hmm. um but what yeah. about um you were asked a question for your recommendations for an at-home chef who wants to recreate the dishes what would you have on the ready in your mise en place huh wait this is for a chef or for someone who's pretending okay yeah, yeah. um Okay, no, you don't cook. So, I mean, you're, like, far <laughs> from that chain. Um, well, I mean... I eat really well, though. Right. I don't either. I don't know. I mean, you know, this is all that I had around, to be honest with you. So, the only thing she that just, I... She had dried seaweed. Yeah, I did. It was just... Oh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I did. So, I mean, the only thing yesterday that I was just, like, thinking, okay, what do we do with another oyster? It's just, like, using the sort of the rind of the watermelon, which is not it's been done before, but just on a slightly different treatment, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, tricky, probably you're not gonna have any of this at home. So then I would recommend that you go to a restaurant. <laughs> but we will post the recipes, and so you can hunt them down. Mm -hmm. Are there any local purveyors that you wanna highlight? So if oh, someone's in New York sure. City and they're going shopping for their list for the recipes, where do you go? I mean, for sure I would say that do support your local purveyors or like your local stores. But yeah. I mean, um, I love my purveyors, all of the, one, the ones that I've been working for, you know, over 10 years. And, you know, Peerless has amazing fish and seafood. I love Island Creek Oysters. They do an amazing job with that. And um, I use them all the time wherever I land. Um, I would say also, uh, you know, Regalis is a really good one. Baldur, even though whatever people want to thank, you know, in our industry, because it's a huge company, they're like, oh, you know, I want to. But Baldur does an amazing job also on yeah. delivery these days. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And they're actually uh, also doing Peerless through Baldur. Um, okay. And then there's more that I cannot probably remember now, but also support the market. You know, market is not going to be around for that much longer for the season. Once you go into December, January, February, is like the saddest point of the market and people just tend to disappear. I would say pay a visit, go there, you know, wow. um, just say hi, double check what they're having, get bread, you know, I mean, they have great bakeries too. So yeah. I think that it's, it's about being in contact, you know, not okay. just when it's summer and yeah. everything's amazing, you know, uh, this month are critical and they will be critical too for the industry as well. Yeah. And, and on that point, what would you be making when it, when the weather goes cold, when you go to the market, what are you looking for? Huh, interesting. Well, I mean, there's a lot of roots, right? Um, just probably transitioning to see how to utilize roots in a different way. Um, what I go for the market, um, I love radishes. You know, I'm a big fan of radishes and daikon, and there's a great variety here. Um, I'm not so much a, you know, big fan of pumpkin, to be honest with you. So I use it, but I'm not not a huge fan so i okay, try I to pumpkin pie. Uh, i hate pumpkin pie yeah, yeah but i love you know i mean i think in general you know there's something really that i don't like i also like all the overwinter greens like spinach malabar 
kale, even though it's like a slightly too popular. Again. Yeah. Is yeah. it? Can you give us an example of like a not boring way to prepare kale? Huh. Interesting. Because kale is a little tired. I mean, oh. well, it's just because it's oh. too popular. Great marketing. Overexposing. Yeah. Whoever's pushing kale. Yeah. For you. Well, um, I don't, wouldn't know right now, but I don't eat kale that much. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't eat kale that much. I, I use more collard greens. I like the I texture of collard greens, greens because it's thicker. Yeah. Very luscious and it feels yeah. almost like a seaweed. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, any meat that you would combine with shellfish in oh, for sure. a menu, what would you do? Uh, quail. Quail. Yeah, I would actually. Why? Because, you know, there's a very old school recipe apparently with chicken and oysters, you know, uh, that you stuff chicken with oysters. Yeah, I thought it was really fun. So I wanted to make that, but I mean, I thought yeah, it was slightly... It's in here. In oh, really? Oyster by it Mark was slightly too, uh, too much work, but um, quail <laughs> and oysters, <laughs> chicken <laughs> oysters. <laughs> I'm so um, glad you did this, because I actually want to eat this. Huh? <laughs> and, uh, but it's about the flavor, you know? It's not fishy, you know? Some people yeah. think that, that oysters are fishy. I think a lot of what the oyster, it's so... Uh, you know, it's very specific. It's about the oyster terroir, you know. Yeah. Probably we don't talk about terroir because yeah. that's for wine, but it's about, you know, the water it consumes. It's about the location, the algae. So that's yeah. why oysters are so different, you know. Yeah. So so it is their own terroir. So mm -hmm. all oysters are different, you know. Some of them develop a deeper cut, but that's about obviously the farmer. There's not a lot of wild oysters these days and uh, but people do an amazing job, and we were actually recently in um, uh, Rhode Island, uh, so we went to see this amazing uh, farm called Ninigret, hmm. and um, we went out, and much more of the oyster job and, you know, the expense, and it's just labor, you know, it's a yeah. very, very intense labor, um, and I really do appreciate that in the sense of, like, people just don't know, so yeah. it's not that it's hard to you know, farm the oyster is just a lot of hands that you need to, and specialize, you know, so, um, um, and Sophia Paspaley makes a really big point, which is that the pearl oyster is very sensitive to its environment and everything in it, mm -hmm. so they have to be comfortable at all times and never under stress. Right. So, you know, if you think about our environment now, mm -hmm. with 8.4 million people in New York City dumping waste into the water, I would be a stressed oyster too. Well, I mm -hmm. think the environment is stressed in general. Yeah. yeah. So Unless we're all yeah. stressed. But eat oysters because apparently 50 a day really assists with your libido. You know that like it's romance. actually not true. It's garbage. Yeah, it is. But I'm into it. I mean, I'll take it. It's all about the uh, amount of, um, what is it, iron. Yeah, I yeah. always like to argue that it's mm -hmm. medicinal because of, yeah. is it iodine also? Yeah. 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 I like iodine. We need iodine. Women especially. Iron. Good for you. <laughs> And it has no calories, so if you have food issues, it's spectacular. Um, if you want to know more about the history of oysters, I recommend The Big Oyster by Mark Perlansky. Um, I am not allowed to say what you're doing next, so I'm going to try to keep alive, but you can follow Victoria's Instagram. It is really exciting. I'm not allowed either. Yeah, it's really, really <laughs> exciting, and it's coming soon, and it's so super cool for the industry, for women in the industry, for food in general. Um, big, big thank you to Christopher Walling for loaning us your collection of spectacular pieces. And um, for those of you watching, please join us for more. And I will be very excited to, you know, shout to the rooftops as soon as we're able to announce what Victoria's up to because it's awesome. And I am now going to go and eat this. Thank you, everybody, for joining Bye. us. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Kathy. Thank <laughs> you so much. See you soon. Bye. Bye.